morning. Welcome to the Chinese Community Church Sunday Worship Service. My name is Pastor Lewis. Let's all stand as we open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> okay, let's pray. Father God, thanks for the Thanksgiving season this past week and all the family gatherings. Thank you that we do have so much to be thankful for, especially uh, experiencing and sharing your love through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you for every person who's here today in person, as well as those joining online later. And we pray that our hearts and our lives would be open to you, to your word, and to the worship experience of being able to express our thanksgiving and our praise to you. So we commit the entire morning to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. If you have not already done so, if you could silence your cell phones, we would appreciate that. Make sure I did that with mine. It's still there. Okay. Uh, we do welcome uh, our brother Ed, uh, who's here to bring God's word to us this morning. Um, this is also the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, again, Advent is a time of preparation for the coming of the Messiah. <clears throat> and that's what Christmas is all about, Jesus Christ. And so the um, candles will be lit each Sunday as well as on uh, our, our candlelight service on Christmas Eve. Representing peace, joy, love, and the Christ candle. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, number two, um, anybody want to make a special announcement about the Christmas orchestra and choir? Small, small here. Yeah. Well, we'll just say that once again, we're going to have some special Christmas music for uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. So please, uh, please attend that. I think you'll enjoy being uplifted by a full orchestra from CCC, as we normally do. Super. Thanks, Ted. Okay, and then number five in the bulletin, the announcements um, on Saturday, December 10th, which is two weeks from yesterday, uh, there is a special memorial service, celebration of life service for our sister Charlene Toda, who went home to be with the Lord in October. So uh, everyone's welcome to attend. Uh, that's right here in our sanctuary. Okay, I think these are all the announcements. Good morning, everyone, and uh, happy Advent. Um, I want to start by telling you a little story. A couple days ago, we went to Apple Hill to buy our Christmas tree, as we normally do. And I'll have Jonathan bring up these two pictures here. We're probably one of the first to go there and, and buy a tree. This is Mariel picking out the tree that she likes. And normally, she'll take about an hour looking for a tree <laughs> while we're directing her to different parts of the forest. This one was at uh, Indian Rock Tree Farm which is up in Apple Hill. It's a beautiful side of a mountain, probably about 10 or 15 acres of land. And you walk up and down and pick out a tree. Uh, this trip was a little different because normally in the past, you'd have cars lined up along the highway and in the parking lot, and people are honking at each other, just kind of angry, waiting to get in to have a good time, go figure. Uh, but this year, the place is empty. And it turns out that they only take reservations going forward uh, for this year and then in coming years. And uh, I didn't realize that until afterwards. I said, well, where's all the people? And one of the workers said, well, that's really a choice we made to pare down the, the chaos and the crowds that come to our tree farm because people just aren't happy, you know, uh, waiting in line and competing for trees and running up and down the mountain and cutting down. And, you know, it's not really in the Christmas spirit. So we decided that we're going to cut way back and only sell enough trees as it takes to support this business, in particular, the widow of the owner uh, who lives in a house on the hill somewhere. And so we only need to make enough money to pay for upkeep and her living expenses, and that's it. And we hope that everyone has a good time. And I thought about it, and this is a business that chose to do less because they really wanted to promote the Christmas spirit. And it wasn't important for them to make a lot of money selling trees because they could. And it was like very refreshing to see that somebody out there is actually doing less to provide more for Christmas. And I think that relates to a lot of things we do because Christmas tends to be very excessive in terms of 
shopping and food and socializing, and yet it was very quiet. And it just happened to be a nice place that we took our family photo here. And indeed, I think their decision to, to cut back and provide a more meaningful experience to fewer people than probably 15, 20 times as many people, but everyone's kind of angry shopping for a tree was the right one. So I want to leave that with you as we start the holiday season. Think about the ways we can slow down and just take a breath and maybe avoid all those crowds and all the craziness and, and do, do less to have more. So with that, I want to um, uh, have you stand up and we'll sing our opening song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. have a seat.
temptations of my heart be pleasing to you, my God. Let's stand for our last song. Give thanks. Mario will lead us into closing prayer. Father God, thank you for this day and your amazing grace that works in our lives. Prepare us as we experience Advent and the coming of your son, Jesus. As we celebrate his birth, we know there are people out there who are alone, separated from their loved ones and separated from you. Use us to bring your presence into their lives through our deeds. Lord, this morning, we thank you that Pastor Law will deliver your message. Prepare our hearts and minds to receive your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray. Have a seat, please. Uh, before Eddie comes up to do the scripture reading this morning, uh, we are beginning the Advent candle lighting. And again, the word Advent from the Latin just simply means coming. So it's we. we talking about our preparation for the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. So this first Sunday of Advent candle lighting, we have the, uh, the Din family, Hank, Dee, and Adele. Glad that we found the automatic lighter. Dad was nervous about lighting matches this morning. <laughs> Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is the period before Christmas when we prepare ourselves to commemorate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today is the first Sunday of the Advent season. The word Advent itself means arrival or an appearing or coming into place. The first candle that we light today of the Advent wreath is the candle of hope. The dictionary defines hope as a feeling of expectation or desire for a certain result to happen. It's a wish for a particular outcome, though it's unsure and uncertain. Biblical hope is not a vague wish about the future. It is a sure and certain expectation. The Bible gives us a hope for a future outcome that is absolutely sure. God's Son, Jesus Christ, gives his people hope, and through him, we can be confident and certain of our future. With Christians around the world, we use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, 
our Savior, Jesus Christ. May we receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in a land of deep darkness, a light has dawned, Isaiah 9-2. And from the apostle Paul, <coughs> excuse me, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 15-13. Let us pray. Dear Lord, during this Advent season, we are reminded of your promises to us, and we know we can live with certainty and with confidence that they will be fulfilled. May your Holy Spirit fill us with your joy and peace as we trust in you, the God of hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we prepare to receive God's word. I'm interested to hear with this sermon. I seen the sugar jar uh, word there, so I'm fascinated to find out how that's all going to. We're going to learn about that this morning. I'll be reading from Acts chapter three, verse seventeen through nineteen. Now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Christ would suffer, repent then, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. May God add his blessing to the sermon and the reading of his word. I'm told that some of you don't know me. My name is Ed Law. I have six children, six adult children, one wife and no concubines. <laughs> I have, uh, I've been a longtime uh, leader of a, a lay ministry called Bible Study Fellowship over 25 years. I'm currently a chaplain at New Folsom Prison. I'm told that of all the uh, uh, prisons in the state system, uh, New Folsom is the most dangerous, and of the four yards, C Yard is the most dangerous. So right in the middle of that, we have Bible study. I'm also a chaplain at uh, Juvenile Hall. I think that's enough. Okay. Well, imagine yourselves uh, on vacation, a cruise vacation. How many have been on a cruise? Raise your hands. Now, I've been on a cruise uh, uh, maybe three or four times. I never thought I'd like cruising but I really do like cruising. I think because I like eating. So imagine yourself on a cruise. It's a beautiful day at sea. You're at a table on the deck look, looking at the beautiful ocean with all the time in the world. You're just decompressing from all the stress of life. And you have an open Bible in front of you because you thought this would be a good time for uh, quiet time devotions, especially since it's Sunday and you're missing the service here at CCC. So you're enjoying yourself, and suddenly, their uh, approaching you is a stranger, a smiling stranger. Now, if you're a man, it's a man. If it's a woman, then it's a woman and about your same age. So somebody very similar to you, and, the, and this stranger comes and uh, looks at you and says, uh, say, uh, friend, um, I'm very curious. I see you have an open Bible here. I don't have any religion, but I was always wondering, how does somebody become a Christian? Could you explain that to me? So what would happen in that scenario? Would you be kind of flustered and tongue-tied? Or you would you be able to confidently and uh, instantly share the gospel basics with this curious stranger? Now, this is no trivial question. Now, think now. What is the most important thing that every man, woman, and child 
through all history, throughout the whole world, can do in their life? I would say is to get right with God. How many would agree with me? To get right with God is the most important thing that every man, woman, and ch child can do in their life. Raise your hand if you think that. I'm glad pastor raised his hand. Now, once you are right with God, what is the most important thing you can do? Wouldn't you say it's to help somebody else get right with God? So back to that scenario on the cruise ship. What would happen to you? Would you confidently and instantly be able to share the gospel basics with a stranger, a curious stranger, a friendly stranger? Or you, would you be flustered and tongue-tied? Now, many decades ago, not many, a few decades ago, when I was a young man, I know you think I'm a young man now, but when I was a much younger man, I was a counselor at Salvation Army Camp Gilmore in Southern California. And you think, oh, uh, summer camp, that's for rich kids. Well, actually not, because you see those bell ringers for the Salvation Army coming out now. They're raising money to send inner city kids to camp. And here I was at Camp Gilmore uh, decades ago, not too many decades. And I had a cabin full of rambunctious six-year-old boys from Watts, from South Central, from other interesting neighborhoods of Los Angeles. And I took them, we had a great time. We went hiking and swimming and played games. We had nutritious and delicious food. But in the back of my mind, I thought, you know what? The most important thing I can do for these boys is to get them right with God. Now, a few, a handful of these boys come from a church background, but for most of them, they were new to the church, they were new to the Bible, they were new to God. So I had to pray. I prayed, God, help me, help me to share the gospel. You know, I could have just given this big book you know, this Bible to these boys saying, okay, boys, here, ha have a Bible. In five days of camp, I want you to read it, and then you'll know. You know, that's not even going to work with adults. So I needed a way to share, and God answered by sugar jar. Now, you look at that, you say, well, that's a typo there. But actually not. It's an acrostic. So you toss out the vowels and you have five letters. Five letters stand for five words. Five key words in the gospel basics. And all these five words have a children's story behind it. And it has a Bible verse. And I thought I'd share with you because at Christmas time, it's not really for adults, it's for children, right? And you're going to, in your gatherings, you're going to have some children, and you may be able to share sugar jar with them. Or you may be able to adapt sugar jar for uh, an adult. So here it is. So imagine the first night, I said, boys, we had some good uh, food at the cafeteria, all kinds of tastes, right? We have uh, sour, we have Better, we have spicy. What's your favorite one? Of course, everybody universally likes sweet. Now, what, what, what makes food sweet? Oh, sugar. And where do you find sugar? Well, you find it in the sugar jar. So put that in your memory. We're going to have a quiz uh, later this afternoon. Sugar jar, sugar jar. And so I would uh, write up, uh, get a, a bullet, a, a, a poster, and I just write it. I said, we're going we're gonna to go through in five nights of devos at night. We're going to cover five things. What do you think? S, well, knock out the vowels. You know, sixth graders, they don't know what vowels are. So I make, make the, the consonants really big. What does S stand for? And of course, they say, oh, you know, salvation or I can. Must mean, mean salvation. I said, good guess, good guess. There's actually a three-letter word I'm looking for. And eventually somebody, one of these kids will say, sin, sin? Is this part of the good news message of God? Well, you know, 
to, un to really appreciate the good news, you have to understand the bad news. Now, what if we saw in the Sacramento Bee a little tiny article that uh, this rare uh, uh, fatal disease, but they found a cure, a pill. Well, you look at that and say, oh, that'd be nice. But what if you, had, you were in Kaiser Hospital and you were days away from dying from this, this rare disease? That would be really, really good news. You have to understand the bad news to understand the good news. So here's the first children's story. It's called the um, Delta King story, Old Sacramento. I was there on, on Thanksgiving, but, uh, believe it or not, and I saw the Delta King. And I said, you know, I'm going to have a contest because I have a million dollars here in my pocket, a million dollars. And if you can jump from the deck of the Delta King and you can jump over the Sacramento River to Yolo County, you're going to get a million dollars. Of course, a lot of people say, that's crazy. I said, I'm going to give you a whole year to practice. You know, so they're all doing jumping jacks and squats. A year passes. We're on the Delta King. And I, I just pile them up. We're counting the money. We're putting it right there. And we have our contestants lining up. And one by one, they you know, do their warm-ups, and they take flying leaps. One by one by one, they, all, all the contestants make their jumps. And what do you think happened? They all fell into the river. You know why? It's, why? Because it's impossible for a human being to jump that far. Even a gold medalist in the Olympics cannot jump that far. It's impossible. The Bible says, for all, in Romans, all have sin and they fall short. See, from the Delta King to Yolo, I mean, you'd have to go past these doors to the next set of double doors. It's impossible. See, uh, we ask, I asked the boys, what is sin? Well, lying, cheating, uh, pulling the girl's hair, going on panty raids at night, saying mean, mean things about your counselor. Yeah, all those bad things, but actually sin is far worse. Because even people who are trying to reach God, they're going to fall short. Now, in that verse, the basic word sin. You know, when the English word sin, you, you have these uh, connotations of doing bad things. Actually, if you go to the original language, it means to miss the mark, to miss the mark. Imagine we had a little target there, right, right in Pastor Lewis's forehead. And I have a million arrows. And I'm trying to hit that target, a million arrows, and I'm always missing the mark. This is very frustrating. Sin is simply missing the mark. It's not just doing bad things, it's far worse. Even people who are trying to reach God are going to miss. And even those who are trying to make that leap uh, across that chasm to God, they're going to fall short. Now that's one part of the bad news that even people are trying are going to fail. But the second part is so uh, the consequences. Because if I try to jump to Yellow County and I fail, the consequence, I'm going to get all wet, right? I'm going to get embarrassed. My friends are never going to let me forget what I did. They'll all pull me out. But the wages of sin, it says in the Bible, is death. We have a memorial service, uh, right, in this church for, for a member of past, and we rejoice because we know where she's going, because physical death is not the end if you have spiritual life. But the death that the Bible talks about is eternal death apart from the glory of God, a, an existence of darkness, of pain, and suffering. And that's the second part 
of the bad news. So, S is for sin. The story is the Delta King story. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Seems pretty hopeless, right? Till we get to G. What does G stand for? It stands for gospel is a good guess. I'm looking for two words which are actually synonyms, grace and uh, a gift, okay? And that, for that we have the dirty shoe story. So on the second night, I take off my shoe and it's covered with mud, you know, from the day's activity camp. I take off my sock, no, I won't go that far. Uh, actually, I, I would, first of all, I would, I would bring out some money and say, who wants this $5 bill? Who wants the $5 bill? Raise your hand if you want $5. Who wants $5? Okay. And all the boys are shocked. Wow. And then I take another five bucks. Who wants this five bucks? Oh. <laughs> and now the boys are really shocked. And I ask, well, what's the difference? Well, the first instance, the, the first boy there, it was just a commercial transaction. You know, I scratch your back, you scratch my back. You know, he, he cleans my shoe, I give you $5. Well, what about the second one? What was different? It was a gift, right? So back to the verse. The wages of sin, the penalty of sin, the consequences of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life. Doesn't matter if you're a, a gold medalist. Uh, uh, you can't. You, it's impossible, right? All I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so what man cannot achieve, not even Pastor Lewis, not even Pastor's wife. I mean, you, yeah, even she has sinned. Even Mother Teresa has sinned. But what man cannot do, God has achieved because he gives it as a gift. So that's the dirty shoe story. Brings us to the R. There's two R's here, right? So the first R, how about some guesses? What could that mean? Receive. That's actually the last R. What's the first R? Redemption is a good guess. Repentance, okay. Repent, now that seems like a real complicated theological religious term, but actually it's very easy. And that is connected with the Disneyland story. First you have the Delta King for the S, then you have the Dirty Shoe for the G, and now you have the Disneyland story. Now, I'm a deficient father of my six children. So all the years when they were growing up, I never took them to the happiest place on earth. Uh, some of you are shocked. Some of you are ready to call 911. Who is this guy on the pulpit here? Be an example for all of us. But let's, let's say, this is just fictitious, right? Let's say I'm a good father, and all my little kids, uh, Caitlin, Sarah, Hannah, Stephen, Daniel, see, so I forget their names, and David, I said, kids, we're going to go to the happiest place on earth, to Disneyland. It's going to be a long, it's gonna be a long drive, so get in the, the, the minivan. You're going to know, <coughs> you're going to know we're close, because in Disneyland, they have an artificial mountain, you know, uh, 
modeled after the Matterhorn in Switzerland. You're going to see it right off the, the freeway there. And so we start driving and driving. And you know how little kids are. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? No, no, no. And then suddenly, off to the distance there, we see it. There's a mountain. It's getting closer and closer, and the kids are getting excited. Oh, Disneyland, Disneyland, Mickey Mouse, and all that stuff, all those rides. And I keep driving, and I keep driving, and I look, and I, I said, that's not the Matterhorn. That's Mount Shasta. <laughs> what happened? Dad wasn't paying attention. He was going north when he should have gone south on I-5. And now, you know, some dads are really proud. They don't want to admit it, but you know, this is, can't, can't be avoided. I just have to confess. And I, I said, kids, daddy made a mistake. I went the wrong way. And I could have kept going, but you know, I said, no. I got to stop. I got to put on the brakes. Get off on, you know, that tent, weed, weed. Get on the overpass, get on the on-ramp going south, going the right way. Now, if you understand that story, you'll understand what it means to repent. I think of the, the, one of the saddest stories in the Bible I uh, remember the story of Cain and Abel. And God actually, after, even after Cain murdered his brother, kind of reached out to him. But the Bible says that Cain walked away from the presence of God. He was going the wrong direction. And since Cain, millions and millions of people, they think they're going the right way. They think they got it figured out, life figured out. But actually, they're going away from God. The Bible says, repent then and turn to God. That's an ax. That your sins will be wiped out. Remember sin? The, that's the bad news. How'd you like to be it, have it wiped out? I like to share this at Juvenile Hall. And as I go with the young men there, and I point to their probation officers at the desk and say, you know, they're tinkering on their uh, computers now. What if they typed in your name and normally you see next to your name all the, you know, the rap sheet? And this is, this is a, a maximum secure. I mean, they could have been assault, they could have been rape, it could have been murder and theft and robbery. And that's why they're in juvie. But what if they looked in the computer, typed their names down, and it was all wiped clean? And the guys at juvie said, whoa. <laughs> and they said, get out of here. You shouldn't be here in juvie. You have nothing. You have no, no, uh, no crimes to report. Get out now. Pretty exciting. Because as far as the east is from the west, so f that's how far that God has removed our sin. Isn't that good news? The gospel means good news. And for those who repent and turn, their sins are wiped away. All right. What does S stand for? What is the story? Delta King. What does G stand for? And what is the story? Dirty shoe. R. Repent. And what is the st story? Disneyland. Oh, so far everybody's going to get an A. A. And the fourth night I have Devos with the boys. And now we're at J, and everybody's guessing, this has got to be Jesus. And it's true. It is Jesus. And I ask the boys, and some of them have, you know, nominal church affiliation, and they've been in church before. And I said, well, tell me everything about Jesus. And they said, well, he's the son of God. He, 
you know, the Christmas story, right? Christmas story, the manger and the shepherds and Joseph and Mary. And he grew up and became a, a great man and uh, he healed the sick, a lot of miracles. And then, of course, they'd say, well, he was crucified, crucified. And others say, what's that? Well, he was executed on a cross. So I had to go to the playground story. Playground story. Imagine two boys, um, Eddie and, uh, let's say, Joey. And they were best of friends. They loved each other. And every day after school, they would love to go to the playground across the street to play. So they asked mom, hey, mom, uh, they're both mothers, and uh, can I go with Eddie? Can I go with Joey? to the playground and play. And she says, of course, you're good boys. You do well at school. You deserve to have some, some fun. But there's one rule. When you get to the road, what is the one rule? Look both ways before you cross. What's the consequence? if you don't follow the rule. You get smushed, right? And you die. So every day, Joey and Eddie, they would hold hands and, and uh, you know, they look both ways. They'd cross the street. They'd have fun at the playground. And then they'd finish. They'd look both ways and come back. One day, Eddie got excited. He went to the street, and he ran across the street, I'm doing slow motion, <laughs> and then at that moment, there's this FedEx truck coming around, delivering Christmas gifts to you, and it was going 200 miles per hour. Ooh. And one inch. Joy was at the curb. Joy remembered to look both ways. He didn't deserve to die. I mean, he followed all the rules. But he saw his, his best friend, the friend he loved, Eddie, in the middle of the street. And so he knew what he had to do. So Joey, this is slow motion. Uh, there's another, there's an adult version, okay? It's, uh, the men especially like that because uh, uh, the ladies, they like chick flicks, right? But men love the war movies. Okay, imagine a war movie, uh, World War II, and uh, the, 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 U, the U.S., the Yankees are, the, the soldiers from the U.S. are in the uh, foxhole. And then suddenly, there comes, it could be a Japanese or German, a, uh, you know, a uh, hand grenade. And everybody looks at that hand grenade. In less than a second, they knew that hand grenade is gonna blow up and everybody in the foxhole will be killed. But at the nick of time, one of the soldiers dashes over There's the adult version. The Bible says a greater love has no man that he give his life for a friend. Also says 
that God so loved the world in this manner, not in this manner loved the, loved the world, that he gave. He gave. He gave. He gave his life. He gave his son. And if you understand the playground story, if you understand the hand grenade story, you'll understand Jesus' crucifixion, its meaning, the meaning of the cross. And that's good news. At Juvenile Hall, and when we talk about love, you know, there are two flavors of love. There's the warm and fuzzy, uh, you know, romantic, affectionate kind of love. I mean, that's biblical. We have the Song of Solomon, and we know that Jesus had that affectionate love for one of his disciples. But there's another kind of love that the verse talks about. It's the fall on the live hand grenade kind of love that you would sacrifice yourself for your buddy. Now, Juvenile Hall, I would say most of the young men there are there because when they were growing up, they did not have a healthy family life. They had no adults to care for them. And so they go out and seek love and acceptance from gangs. And that gets them into trouble. Because there's a love that a man needs, a young man needs, from another young man. It's not the, you know, warm, fuzzy, you know, effect. That's not that kind. He wants the fall on a live hand grenade kind of love. He wants to know that there's another man who has his back, who's willing even to give his life for him. And I'm sure women have that same need. In fact, everybody does. And because of sin, we know the consequence. We need somebody to save us. Somebody who would sacrifice themselves because they love us. And that's the J. That's the playground story. Let's review. S stands for what? And what's the story? It's the Delta King story. G? Grace. And what's the story? And R? Repent. What's the story? Disneyland. J? Jesus? and the playground story. Which brings us to the last R. This is an interesting one. R stands for receive. The story is the Super Bowl story. Super Bowl story. And this the boys can really relate to. Imagine their favorite uh, football team. Let's see, in L.A., what's, what's the pro uh, football team in L.A.? It used to be the Rams. Rams and the Chargers. Imagine your favorite uh, uh, football team. They, made, they barely made it to the, uh, to the uh, Super Bowl, and they're down by a touchdown, and time is basically out. They have a few seconds, one last play, so the ball is snapped, to their favorite uh, quarterback, and he goes back deep into the end zone of the opposing team, and he, he throws that you know, proverbial Hail Mary. I mean, that ball just, just spirals, spirals, and everybody's looking and said, wow, that's a great pass, and it goes straight, that, that football goes straight into the numbers of the favorite receiver, deep into the, the end zone, and everybody is amazed. We won, the, we won the Super Bowl, and all the cheerleaders, the pretty cheerleaders are jumping, and everybody's screaming, and everybody's clapping, and we won the, foot, uh, we won the Super Bowl. Well, did they win the Super Bowl? Why not? 
Well, let's not, let's not say he dropped it. Let's just say the rules of football, until the referee signals that he took possession, right? It could be right here. But until he takes possession, until he actually receives it, he didn't get the touchdown. And you know what? I mean, there, I mean, uh, it doesn't happen at this church, but you know, the church down the street, you know, the, the Japanese church, um, they have that issue. You know, people come in and they sit down and they, they give their offering and they pray and they, they're nice, they, they pay their taxes, and everybody's cheering and said, oh, they must be a Christian. And then, you know, they carry this big old Bible and once in a while they'll, well, you know, read it and they say, wow, they're a Christian. But you know what? Until they actually take possession, unless it becomes them. You see, it may seem that way because their parents are Christian or because all their friends are true believers. But it's something that every person in this world has to come to that transaction when he actually takes possession. You see, I can, I can uh, get another $5, and I can, I can offer it to somebody. He's very suspicious. I can offer it to somebody. I can offer it to somebody. Offer it to somebody. But unless... <laughs> but unless they actually take possession, it's not really theirs. So on the last day, the boys are going to go home from camp. And I challenge them and say, you know, a few of you, you actually go to church. And you may think you're a Christian because you're doing all the right things. But until you have really received and taken for yourself the gift of God, it's not really yours. So I offer on that last night for all the boys to really uh, pray and to examine themselves. And if they were kind of kidding themselves, thinking, well, I'm doing all the activities, but they've never really received that gift. I ask them, well, is the Holy Spirit working in your heart? If he is, don't just keep going your own way. Because that's the wrong way. You gotta stop. You gotta stop in your tracks. You gotta turn around. You gotta go to God. The promise is if you turn, your sins are wiped away. And as many as received him, that's in first is John, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Some of these children from the inner city, they're not too proud of their family life. And to have that concept of being a child of God, a, a, a child of the creator of the universe, is absolutely awesome. And it is. And it is. And maybe one or two here of you, I don't know you very well, maybe one or two of you here are ready right now to make that move to repent, to receive. Well, let's pray. And Lord, in this Christmas season, as these good people uh, you know, have many opportunities to interact, to meet uh, strangers, make uh, acquaintances, to see children, I pray that you will bring a sugar jar to mine and that they will not be flustered or tongue-tied. They will be instantly and eagerly willing and ready to share gospel basics to somebody else. Give them the wisdom, the sensitivity. If it's a child, to give it in a child's level. If it's in an older adult, in an adult level. And I do pray for maybe one or two here. Maybe you are working on their heart as at this moment. It's not something we can do. It's not something based on the power of oratory. It's just the truth of God's word that they are responding to. 
And I pray, Lord, that they will repent, turn to you, and receive the gift in faith and in belief uh, that they may have the wonderful life of eternal life that you have promised in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for your attention. Remember your homework and quiz each other this afternoon. What is Sugar Jar? The last story is Super Bowl. Thank you, Brother Ed. Um, now I'm going to have to bring $5 bills every Sunday I preach, I guess. <laughs> It is a good reminder to us, though, with Christmas season upon us, and I'm sure people get busy, you know, with decorations and shopping and gifts and parties and gatherings and all that is great stuff, wonderful blessings, but uh, as Brother Ed reminded us, the greatest gift that we could possibly receive ourselves, as well as share with someone else, is the good news of Jesus Christ. So, sugar jar, whatever helps us remember the clear gospel good news presentation uh, just commit that to memory, and uh, let's all put it into practice as best we can, okay? Uh, this is the time for the offering prayer, and we don't pass a plate because of COVID, but uh, we do have a basket on the uh, podium on the way out. Uh, if you'd like to give tithes or offerings, feel free. Uh, so let's go ahead and give thanks for the offering at this time. Okay, let's pray. Father God, thanks again for the helpful reminder uh, through Brother Ed, your word, that the good news of Jesus Christ is the most important gift we could ever receive or share with anyone else. And especially at this Christmas season, we pray that that would be our focus, that we would not be overly distracted by all the other busyness that goes on with the holiday season, but that as your children especially, we would keep our focus on Jesus because it is all about Jesus Christ. And Father, thank you for uh, the brothers and sisters who continue to give faithfully tithes and offerings. Um, thank you for those who give both in person as well as uh, through other means, those who cannot be here in person. And thank you, Father, for the stewardship that you've placed in our hands. We pray for the leadership, especially as we continue to look to you for guidance, for wisdom, and how we utilize these funds uh, to further your kingdom work, both here in the community as well as beyond through our missionaries. And so, Father, we commit all that to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this is the time of pastoral prayer. And um, again, Christmas is upon us, so uh, let's continue to keep uh, ourselves, our families, our church, and uh, and all the Christians that we know worldwide that we would be able to, again, keep our focus on Jesus and uh, just to celebrate and have the uh, joy that Jesus brings us, but to think about opportunities of being able to share his love with others around us. So join with me at this time as I do the pastoral prayer. Okay, let's pray. Father God, again, we're thankful for reminders because all of us have spiritual amnesia to one degree or another. Uh, you could bless us in so many ways, and then minutes later we can forget that you're even there. Uh, but Father, thank you that we can gather for worship, both in person as well as online. It helps all of us to refocus um, through all the busyness of life, whether it be work or school, friends, parties, uh, shopping, all of the, the busyness that goes on, especially with Christmas. But Father, help us to keep our focus on you, to be so thankful for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, the gift of eternal life through simple faith and trust in him. And thank you that that gift actually gets more precious and um, valuable and meaningful to us day by day and that we can share that gift with others. Uh, thank you for the church, our church vision statement, which is simply to better experience and share God's love. And I pray you'll help us to keep that in mind even this Christmas season. 
And Father, we're thankful for the, the Thanksgiving family gatherings this past week. Uh, we're thankful for each one. We're, we pray especially for those who might be traveling uh, today, tomorrow, and the coming days. And, and with Christmas season coming up as well, if we pray for safety with all the travel. Uh, we often take that for granted. And thank you that uh, families can be um, reunited uh, because of distance. And Father, we want to continue to thank you for uh, bringing healing and protection to those who have had COVID, uh, other illnesses and physical challenges. We're so thankful that we can always trust you. Um, and thank you for the gift of health. Father, thank you also for the PASA search committee and for their faithfulness over all these years uh, after I retired uh, three years ago and just thankful for uh, some of the new possibilities that are before us. We continue to pray for your wisdom, uh, for a real spirit of unity and harmony as we trust you to provide the next pastor of this church. Father, thank you for the many programs and ministries and, and um, just the various uh, outreach opportunities we have as a church. We think of the basketball program, how you've used it over the decades uh, to just touch the lives of many individuals and families. We pray that if possible, that program could restart this year and that we know that they're faithfully moving ahead and trying, but uh, they're dependent on other churches in the, uh, in the league to be able to put together teams and we pray that that can still happen. Uh, for this season. Thank you for the new Pickleball uh, Fellowship and for the many in the community who've taken part in that. Thank you for Patty and others who work to prepare that and to make it possible. Uh, thank you that we have the opportunity of sharing again a little bit of the good news uh, each week with that group. And Father, uh, I pray that you'll just help us to unite our hearts in praying for uh, this young man, a brother in Christ, Reuben, who has been a part of our men's Bible study uh, through Zoom uh, the past year. And for him and his brother, as they continue their very dangerous uh, journey to try to immigrate to the United States, they haven't heard anything for over a month, and uh, we just pray that um, uh, we'll, we can entrust them to your care and protection, that they'll make it here safely, and that their uh, request for asylum will be granted. And Father, again, for each one who still struggles with physical challenges, uh, we pray for your healing and for your encouragement. Thank you that Melanie, our sister, is back with us today. Uh, thank you for watching over her and her family. We do pray for her needs, though, for a new job and for other um, material um, needs that, that are present there in her life and for her family. And Father, for um, our dear sister, Gan, who is on hospice care, we're thankful for those of us who've had opportunities of visiting, of being able to share a little bit of your love with her and your encouragement. Uh, thank you for her loving family. Uh, and we just pray that she might continue to sense your presence day by day. And that each of us will remember that every day is a gift from you. We continue to pray for those who've lost loved ones in recent months. Uh, we think of our brother Derek Lamb, the head of ACC, whose daughter died very suddenly several months ago, and uh, we continue to pray for your comfort and encouragement. And we also pray for the physical family of Charlene Toda, as well as for our church, her spiritual family, uh, who really misses her, and uh, she died suddenly. And, but we're thankful that she went home to be with you, and we're thankful that in just a couple of weeks, her celebration of life service right here at the church can be a, a time of testimony, a time of giving you praise and glory and honor for her life and for her love uh, that she lived out the mission of this church to better experience and share your love. And so, Father, thanks again for this morning of worship. We give you all the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us, and thank you, Pastor Ed. It's good to see you again. Let's stand and sing our closing song. You are my all in all. You are my strength when I am weak. 
remain standing for closing prayer and uh, before I pray let me just mention the church has a little gift for each household a free little book called The Case for Christmas by Lee Strobel and it's an excellent little book that uh, provides uh, a lot of thought provoking evidence for why we believe uh, the infant in the manger was in fact Jesus Christ the Messiah. Uh, Lee Strobel is an excellent author, so one per household. You can pick them up on your way out, as well as some individually wrapped refreshments, okay? So let's pray. Father God, again, we thank you for the time of worship. Thank you so much for our brothers and sisters who led us in worship. Thank you for our brother Ed, who brought your word to us. Thank you for every person who's here in person, as well as those joining online. And thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, the real meaning of Christmas. And thank you, Father, for uh, the opportunity to ex better experience and share your love. Dismiss us now with your blessing. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>